everybody and welcome to this new central exclusive. I'm excited to be sitting with the Minister of Tourism representing the Republic of South Africa. Honorable, it's such a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you very much and thank you for interacting with me. You I'm know, enjoying Lagos. I, I can tell you look like uh, you've been touched by a little bit of the Nigerian sun in a, in a great way. Definitely. And I know you've had your pepper soup, you've had uh -huh. your kettle, you've Yes, and they um so I, I've, I've enjoyed it. Lovely food, I must say. Right. So the delicacies, Nigerian delicacies, I attest they're very good. Um, yet before I leave, I'm gonna try jollof rice. So I'll be the judge between whether Ghana does better or Nigeria. And then I'm gonna have to ask you to go to Senegal as well to okay. make sure you, you bring I that do. into the mix. Okay, yes. I'll do because that. Because the battle continues around I, West Africa. I, I but will I'll, do I'll that. I'll trust your review. I'll trust the <laughs> review. Now, just to you know, get into a little bit of your port, your profile. You know, you've served as a Minister of Science and Technology, a Minister of Communications, a Minister of Energy as well. So you're coming into this office with a wealth of experience. Well, it's been six months, but it's a very critical time for Brand South Africa right now. What is at the very top of your agenda? Very top of my agenda, obviously, because the president has given us a target of increasing our international arrivals at home to 21 million by 2030. So that is my work. But secondly, um, both doing domestical as well, promoting South Africa, but also critical markets um, that we're looking at to promoting South Africa. Dealing with the challenges in terms of the brand, as we are saying, uh, looking at what are the causes of people, for example, who would want to stay away from South Africa and how do we resolve it. So part of my priority is to be able to look at those issues and find a solution to them. What's the plan to kind of reconcile these two realities of this beautiful South Africa that, you know, we see, uh, especially on social media and on television versus some of the stories that are shared of experiences of foreigners on the ground? Definitely the issue of the attacks on foreign nationals uh, becomes an issue and a priority for the South African government. The president has already said to us we need to be able to deal with it. I think one of the things which I'll come back to is some of the fake news that got to haunt us. Um, but the issue is the attacks did happen. And I'll come, that's what I'm saying, let's park the issue of the fake news. But the attacks did happen. And as they happen, the source of it was a challenge and this is sometimes it's important we took a decision as the south african government initially to say we're not going to talk about what led to this because we want to deal with the problem but as we deal with the problem we want to make sure that as well we do not have the recurrence again and we were conscious we yes that's what i'm saying we wanted to say because when they started happening last time in 2017 we, we were shocked, caught by surprise on it, um, and we thought we dealt with it because we, we responded and then it went quiet. But when they recapped this year and then we said, what is it that we need to do to ensure that it's a lasting solution? So the president firstly requested all of us to be able to go on the ground to talk to communities as leaders. Also requested responsible communication from all the leaders in the country. Then he sent the envoys to explain what happened. Then again, he appointed President Kikwete, former President Kikwete from Tanzania, former President Shisane from Mozambique, as part of the people who are going to help us to find long-lasting solutions. What is happening is that they're bringing communities together, both the communities who are foreign nationals in South Africa and South Africans, facilitated in terms of dialogue, assisted by religious leaders. So that is one of the things that we are doing in long term to be able to find a lasting solution. But again, the other issue that one gives context to is that over time, because for some years now, our economy has not been growing. So with the economy not growing, people are losing jobs. Now, that's where again, the issue of tension comes in. To say, ordinarily, if you are in pain or you are facing difficulties, it's very rare human beings are able to blame themselves to say it's the environment I'm in and therefore they always try to find a scapegoat. And sometimes people think that I'm not employed because a foreign national in South Africa has taken my job. So it has been our responsibility as leaders and government to be able to say, let's work together to grow our economy so that everybody can have 
jobs, both South Africans and foreign nationals who are coming into our country for benefits. So, you know, where do we draw the line between what's happening on the ground, uh, you know, as an immigration issue and the security and the, the concern for well-being of tourists uh, who, who want to come in and visit the country? Look, there's been a lot of, I, for example, people who hear that word of mouth will say Johannesburg is not safe. I grew up, I was born and raised in Johannesburg. I was born and raised in Soweto. But over years, people have believed that Soweto is the most dangerous place. And I can tell you, it's one of the most city, safest areas in the country. In terms of tourists, we have a different uh, approach and work that we've been doing in terms of safety, but not only for tourists who are coming from the continent, but across the globe. So we deal with that every time. We have our safety strategy to make sure that they can do. But we always say to our tourists, don't do what you don't do at home. If you don't walk at 3 a.m. as a woman in your own home, why should you do it in South Africa, for example? Because you're making yourself vulnerable, because nowhere in the world is the tourism safety strategy that you're launching, uh, you know, obviously there, there is a, a safety uh, awareness from, from yourselves as a tourism department. Uh, how will that roll out and how does that uh, contribute to this conversation? What we are trying to do is what all countries will battle with. For example, somebody arrives at an airport, gets pocketed, a cell phone is taken. Somebody walks in the streets, a wallet is put up. And that's what we are trying to deal with. It's, it's, it's a global phenomenon. Phenomena. If you go across the globe, you'd find all countries, and when you look at WTO as well in terms of their reports, all countries put these mechanisms as precaution and preventative. But where it happens, you deal with it as a, a, as a mechanism to be able to build confidence in your market within the tourism. Now, what we are doing from our side is that we looked at where are the hotspots in terms of pickpocketing, in terms of people being taken, their cell phones or their cards, things like those. And we are saying we want to create safety because we've identified them as hotspots. And we are saying we're sending the people in those areas. For example, we've got a mechanism to respond. We've got monitors on the ground who we are deploying as the Department of Tourism in support of the police, additional to that, in the hotspot where our tourists are so that they can enjoy and have. But also they help us to say to the people to give them caution. You know, warning, don't do this. Others, because they go into dangerous areas, it's not even about being robbed, but they get to fall on the cliffs that they're not supposed to be. So safety is broadly in terms of not being injured because you are in the wrong areas, not being attacked, or not even going into the areas. For example, we have life, we have animals. And you find somebody going into driving in the areas they're not supposed to. And then they get to be attacked by the animals because we don't tame our animals. So that's why one of the things, safety is broad in those contexts. That we have people who will say, no, Mamoluko, don't go into that area. It's not a design zone for driving. You will have the animals attack you. Don't go into this cliff, you will fall and all that. But in areas where we think they are pickpocketing and all that, we bring in even in technology. So the background of being former Minister of Technology, so Science and Technology, is coming together. to play, it's exactly. Incredible. That's why the experience is so it's, important. It's very important. So we're bringing technology as well. The cameras, the drones, we're looking at the drones. Um, but the security cluster is saying to us, the drones sometimes when they hit, because if the drones um, are flying, if they hit the wall, they do explode. So we're looking at mechanisms to get them where we can operate them and how do we make sure that they do support us within... Yeah. Let's now look at, you know, the concerns of the West African traveller. Uh, <laughs> I think number one on the list is the ease of being able to get a visa. It's become <laughs> a frustrating battle for many. Uh, I have a friend who missed her 40th birthday uh, that was she had planned in a villa in Cape Town because her visa never came out on time. Yeah. So, you know, what are the challenges? Because we, we don't really get to understand what the challenges being faced are and what can we look forward to as solutions being presented? Mm -hmm. No, definitely we do acknowledge the difficulties around the visa application over time, process and the response. We had a huge backlog in the mission here, both in Abuja and in, in Lagos. Um, the teams have really worked very hard to ensure that we reduce the, the backlog and I'll come to more detail and what we are doing about it. But I think both ways, what I want to appeal to those who are listening as well, because they've got to assist us with moving. For example, 
One of the challenges that we've got is that we have high number of volumes of fraudulent documents, especially the first timers. Is that unique to this market or is it a broad it's, issue? No, it's not an, a broad issue. It's yeah, it's market. unique to the market. Um, so, and then it delays the process because now you have a team that have learned to be more vigilant, that has learned to verify and verify because we have high volumes of documents which are not. For example, five people will use one document of um, you know, testimony or proof of funds and they just change the address. And then when you verify that doesn't exist, or somebody says, I'm going to this, uh, this is the person who's going to receive. When you phone, the person is in Lagos, is not in South Africa. You know, such things do impact on the rate because when an official starts picking up these things, they take long on one application. And whereas they could have done 10 at that time, you know. So we are appealing that let's assist each other to be able to make sure that we are able to fast track the processes. Yes, we did have as well the challenge of capacity in terms of the number of people who are able to do this. You can imagine with the number of these processes having to do the verification and all that. And eventually with the people that we have, now we've picked up that there's a workload that is there. We've acknowledged that we are resolving that. The Department of Home Affairs has assured me that they will look at additional capacity for this market. But another exciting news for us is that we are currently piloting the e-visa system in South Africa. It's being piloted in Kenya, and we believe that is going to be a very good tool for us to be able to get the fast tracking of the visa. You'll apply anywhere. You are within the country, Nigeria. You don't have to be in Lagos. You don't have to be in Abuja. We're resolving that. You'll apply online, and then you'll get your reference number. When it's ready for you to stamp your passport, then it will say, go to the embassy, you stamp the passport. So pending a successful pilot, when can we anticipate this you know, launching and becoming available to, to West Africans, to Nigerians? Yeah, we're hoping that by 2020, uh, beginning of uh, first quarter, first quarter of 2020, we should be able to. So I'm crossing my fingers as Minister of Tourism because this is a key deliverable that will help me in terms of the numbers. We are working closely with Home Affairs. They're giving us updates. Uh, they've picked up some glitches now. Um, they will sort them out and we're hoping that uh, early next year they should be. So our president, heads of state, uh, His Excellency President Ramaphosa has put pressure on us to get this sorted. Despite a 2.1% drop in visitors to South Africa this year, uh, I understand that African visitors have actually increased in numbers, uh, which I think is a beautiful story to tell despite everything that has happened this year. You know, this is a great opportunity for Pan-African synergies. Uh, what does that look like, especially with the tour that you've done, you know, from Ghana, now in Nigeria? What are the, the possibilities of synergies uh, with the rest of Africa? Look. Part of what we're doing as, as the country, we've seen the drop in terms of the international arrivals, but today our statistics, South Africa has released the stats, we've increased our contribution to the GDP, we're increasing in terms of um, contribution to job creation, so it's positive news for us. It clearly shows that we are on the right track to resolving the challenges that we have, because once there's economic growth, then we'll see the easy uh, resolving of the social ills becomes a, an issue of the past. So with what we are doing, part of what I've taken as a responsibility as the minister from a political level as the leadership of this portfolio is to say, I need to go myself to the markets. I need to listen to the issues myself as the person who's responsible for resolving these challenges. Hear from what the people are saying on the ground, tangibly, because I have the authority to be able to resolve those issues and be able to resolve them. That's the first thing. Secondly, we're looking forward because the markets on the continent has been doing well. But what we are saying as South Africa is that it's not the benefit to us only as South Africa. We're working with a lot of ministers reaching out. I met with Minister Mohammed, uh, where we are partnering in terms of exchanges between South Africa and Nigeria. And as we ease the travel, we believe in that there will be more travelers between the two countries because 
if we rise, not one nation should rise on the continent. All of us must rise together so that to the benefit, so that our citizens can benefit more and it's to the benefit of the future generation. Certainly, so a true spirit of Ubuntu and uh, you know, I'm excited about what 2020 holds. I know a lot of Nigerians specifically will be excited about the, uh, the digital, the online visa application. So we're also yes. crossing our fingers for that. Thank you so much for your time, Honorable Kubayan Gubandi. This has been an incredible interview. Thank you very much.